what you would have us see, Lord, this morning. As Mark, Pastor Marcel comes and gives us your word this morning, may you once again, through our hearts, open us up to what you'd have us here this morning through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 You may be seated. That lyric says, he's the only one who can. He's the only one who can. And I got to reemphasize that today, that he's the only one who can. And he's the only one who could make it possible for us to be here today, two years from the date that Parkview Baptist Church opened up their doors to us and basically said, hey, you can come worship here and come and celebrate the Lord God here. I mean, July will actually make, or June, I should say, will make three years for Crossroads Christian Community Church. And we started in homes, you know, like most small churches or most churches that are just starting up. We started out in homes. Then we were blessed by the garage ministry in Smithfield. Uh, we were just blessed to be there for a season. And then Parkview said, hey, you know what? You're non-denomination. You believe in the Holy Spirit. You all speak in tongues. You all believe in Jesus, the Holy Ghost. You all believe in this. Guess what? We don't care. Denominational walls come down. You're ready to worship the Lord Jesus Christ? Then come do so here. And we're grateful that they allowed us to do so. So with that, we're here celebrating two years here at Parkview. And we want to just celebrate by having cake and desserts and coffee, tea, water, whatever you all like will be available in the fellowship hall after service. Now, I know you didn't come just for that. You came for the word, but, you know, that's always a great thing. I had someone share with me that, hey, if you had that after service, every service, you might bring more people. But I'm glad they said that because today's word is going to be a hard word for us as a church, as a church. And I don't mean as crossroads. I mean as the body of believers that we are. Today's going to be a word where the church is going to get got. The church is going to get got today. It's kind of quiet, so let's just jump right in. So today we're going to start off with Genesis 19. In Genesis 19, what we're hearing about is that God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's doing so because of their wickedness. He's basically done with them, and he tells Lot, you know what? I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to rescue you. So it starts in verse 15, and it goes through 26. And it says that the angel of the Lord urged Lot, saying, Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away by the punishment of the city. But he lingered. He lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought him out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Verse 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire, and he overthrew their, those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Father, thank you for your word today. And Father, may we always stay steadfast, looking forward to you and never turning back. So this morning's message, the title is, when over there seems better than over here. When over there seems better than over here. Like I was saying, please understand that the word that I'm sharing today is not for us as individuals, but for us together as one group known as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Now the Lord God, he's going to minister to whoever, however he wants to. So receive it for yourself, but realize that this is for the church, the body of Christ as a whole. Now before we go deeper into it, we need to look at the gospel of Luke as well. The gospel of Luke chapter 17 in verses 20 to 33, Jesus, he's providing us more insight on Genesis chapter 19. And in the scriptures, he's having a conversation with the Pharisees, and then he also is talking to the disciples, and he says, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. He's saying it's not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And then he says to the disciples that the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not 
see it. There will be days that we desire to see the Son of Man, and we won't see him. We won't see him. And then he goes on to say, and they will say to you, look there and look here. Don't go and follow them, he's saying. Don't go and follow them. So in other words, what he's trying to say to us is that there are going to be those out there that are going to try to determine for you where is the best place to look to look over there versus over here, that we're going to long to see Jesus, that we're going to long to see his work. We're going to long to see him do something, and we're not going to see it. We're not going to see it in our natural eyes. We're not going to see it the way we want to see it, but others are going to tell us, see it the way we see it. The world is going to tell us, look for him here, look for him there, and Jesus is saying, don't follow them. Don't follow them. Then he goes on through verse 26 through 33, and he's reminding them about the times of Noah and how they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and then they were all destroyed. Then he goes on to talk about Lot the same way, how they were destroying, uh, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were doing the same type of stuff, and he was saying to them that now they were going to be destroyed and Lot was going to be saved, and as Jesus Jesus is talking about all of this. In verse 32, he says, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. 33, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Jesus, he's having an intense conversation here with the Pharisees. He's having a conversation with the disciples. And in the midst of all of this, he says, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Why is Jesus telling us to remember this nameless woman? A nameless woman. He didn't say remember Eve, remember Sarah, remember Hannah, remember all these other women, Elizabeth, Mary, Miriam, Martha. Remember all these women that have a name. He's telling us to remember a nameless woman. Why? He says remember Lot's wife. This woman is one of those that has the shortest bio in the Bible. And yet Jesus is telling us remember her. Remember her, in Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, these people are literally touched by an angel, saved from destruction, brought to a place, and the angel of the Lord says, don't look back. Don't look back. And somewhere in their longing, somewhere in their lingering, the scripture says that Lot's wife turned and looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. A pillar of salt. What's Jesus trying to get us to see here? He's getting us to see that she got stuck. She got stuck and she never moved. She never went further. She was never free and moved into the promise of what God had provided for her because she got stuck and she lingered and she longed for something that she was supposed to leave behind and step into the future of what God had for her. But instead, she was more concerned with what looked better over there than what was over here, right in front of her. Right in front of her, she had just been saved by angels, but she was so concerned with what was over there versus what was over here. And Jesus is showing us that it's time for us to stop longing for what is over there. It's time for us to stop longing for what the world tells us is better over there versus what is currently right here in front of us. Because if you linger too long, if you long for what's there, you're going to get stuck And you're going to become a pillar of salt. And you're going to become a pillar of salt not only in your mind, but also in your heart and in your actions as well. We're going to get stuck. And as a church, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do what we're supposed to do. Desire is going to stop moving in our lives. Passion is going to stop moving in our lives. The truth of the word of God is going to stop moving in our lives. And we're not going to be able to move forward because hope, hope, will stop moving in our lives. And I was telling some people this morning that the word today is going to be rough because, like I said, the church has to be God today. And I know that's not proper English. That's what the teenagers, how they say it, that the church has to be held accountable today for its actions, for what it's failed to do and for what it's done inappropriately. Inappropriately. And Jesus is showing us that, that the word of the Lord has been and will always be, don't turn back, there's no turning back. 
So we need to stop looking at the past years. We need to stop looking at 2021. It's no longer 2021. In fact, it's no longer 2020. It's no longer 2020. It's 2022. It's a new year. It's a new month. It's a new day. And God is doing a new thing. And there's no turning back. We have to go forward. We have to remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife. We're always longing for what was. We're always longing for what was. If, if I just still had this, or if I just still had that, things would be okay. If we as a church, if we just still had this, or if we just still had that, everything would be okay. But God is saying, I'm doing a new thing. I'm repaving a new way. He knows we're tired. He knows that we've been dealing with a season where things have been rough. It, the season has been going on long before COVID, where there's been hatred, a brother against brother, sister against sister, culture against culture, age against age. Everybody's been against each other, and then COVID hits, and now we've become worn down by COVID and everything else that's been going on with it. But if we look back, we're going to turn into pillars of salt, and we're not going to be able to step into the newness of what he has in store for us. We're longing for over there much more than what's right here, and it's produced a sense of lost hope. We've lost our hope. We've lost our hope because we're longing for, for some idea that we thought we had. For some idea, in our minds, we kind of figured how things were going to play out, and because it hasn't played out that way, we've lost our hope. We've longed for God, that God was going to come through in a certain way, that he was going to give us certain things in a certain manner, in a certain time span, and it didn't happen that way. God was going to provide healing for this person. God was going to make a way for this person. God was going to do all of this. That's what we had hoped for, but it didn't happen. So we lost our hope. We lost our hope, and then the world started telling us, look for hope here. Look for hope over there. Look for hope in this political party. Look for hope in that political party. Look for hope in this person, in that person, in this or that. And we've misplaced our hope just like Luke is telling us. Just like he's telling us that the world is going to tell us to look over here, look over there for the Son of Man. You're going to find him here. You're going to find him there. And Jesus said, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. And we begin to long because we just couldn't see what we had hoped for. We begin to long. If you remember the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, you know, Jesus is actually with them, but they don't even realize it. And their words were in Luke 24, 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Because they were longing for something that they had hoped, for something that they had put in their own mind, they didn't realize what was right in front of them. The Savior was right in front of them. But because they had hoped for something different, not the way God had planned, they missed him right in front of him. Right in front of him. Jesus is with us. And many of us are constantly looking back that we're missing the fact that he's right here. He's right here with us all along. He hasn't left us. He hasn't left us or forsake us. He is right here. Now, this season has been very tragic, has it not? We've lost friends, we've lost family members, we've lost so much, people have lost jobs. You know, we forget how it was in early 2020, how people were losing jobs right away, how businesses, you know, they just weren't able to keep up and they had to close their doors. It's been a tragic season, but it's caused an unveiling of the church. Come on. It's caused an unveiling of the church, and I'm speaking about the church as a whole. I'm not just talking about Crossroads. I'm not talking about Parkview. I'm not talking about the church across the street or that one. I'm talking about the body of believers that make up the church. Many felt that the pandemic, vid, like I call it, vid, was a call for people to come to church. But what vid was was a call for the church to become the church. It was a call for the church to become the church. And the Lord, what he's doing is he's allowing us to see inside the bride. He's allowing us for, us for us to see inside the bride because I wonder if more of the current church's hopes were shattered during vid than anything else. 
This shattered the hopes of the churches. This shattered the hopes of what the churches had hoped for, and as a result, they misplaced their hope for a season. And I pray it's only for a season that we would be realigned, that we would realign our hope before it's too late. Because churches had hoped that they would have the best venues. You know, oh, that's awesome. We got this beautiful chapel. Or we have the sanctuary. It has a thousand seats. You know, we hoped for the best venues, the best locations where people would come, where people would just flood in the gates. We hoped for those things. We hoped for the best worship team. We hoped for the best sound equipment. We hoped for the best decor, the best paint jobs, the best lighting. We hoped for all these things. We hoped for the best marketing. And we hoped for the right people to come through the doors. We hoped for the right people. We hoped that there would be less challenges. We hoped that there would be less struggles, that there would be less betrayals in the church, that would, there would be less people falling away from the church. Churches hoped, but it was misplaced hope because they put their hope in people. They put their hopes in systems. They put their hopes in plans. You know, we all have that five-year plan. In five years, we're going to be here, you know, as individuals. Well, churches do the same thing. In five years, we hope to be here. In five years, we hope to be there. And we put our hopes in this plan. We put our hopes in this system. We put our hopes in everything else but God. But God. Instead of putting our hope in God. And for that... I have to say this, on behalf of churches everywhere, regardless if they choose to acknowledge it, regardless if there's pastors watching me or other churches watching me online, I'm going to tell you that I apologize on behalf of the churches. I apologize on behalf of the churches. I, I apologize to those who were supposed to be served by the church, but instead the church was serving themselves. The church was serving themselves, and unveiling of the churches has taken place, and this unveiling uh, was before the pandemic, and it's after the pandemic, and it's all of this, an unveiling has taken place. And as individuals who make up the church, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to take up our cross. We're supposed to deny ourselves and follow Jesus with no turning back. In this series, I've talked about this already. I told you all I wasn't a person of series, but God has been placing the word slowly but surely. He didn't give it to me all at once, and little did I know that he's putting the pieces together, and everything matches up. I talked to my wife sometimes after the service about certain things that were said, and I'm like, it's amazing how God is putting this all together right before my eyes, and little did I know that there would be a rebuke on the church on the last day of the series. And I'm like, okay, Lord. Um, we're supposed to be celebrating here. People are supposed to come, but you're having me rebuke the church. And it's not so much a rebuke. He's saying, I want the church to line up because if you're going to go forward, I want you to go forward the right way, not the wrong way. So this can't be a popularity contest. It can't be a popularity contest to see how many people is liked by the church. Instead, it should be a constant reminder of who the church is supposed to be like. Jesus. It's not so much how many like us is who we're supposed to be like. Crossroads can't be concerned with getting followers. Instead, what Crossroads has to be concerned with is making followers, making followers of Jesus. We're not even here to get you to come to this church. Come on. Wow, that's bad. (laughs) That's bad for a leader to say, hey, I don't even want you to come to this church. Not that I don't want you to come to this church. It's that my goal is not to make you come to this and this only church. What I'm supposed to do is that to realize that God has planted us here to be the church, to be an example and not what's been unveiled, not what's been unveiled during this season. You see, churches were supposed to make disciples. We're supposed to make disciples that are committed to serving, But the unveiling showed that the only thing we were committed to was comfort and convenience. We served only when it's comfortable, and we served only when it was convenient during the pandemic. We served only when it was comfortable, I'm going to say it again, and only when it was convenient. Like right now with the snow, it's not convenient to come out because there's snow on the ground. But we'd go to work. Okay, let me keep going. All right. A pandemic was not supposed to cancel the established church. 
A pandemic was not supposed to cancel the established church. We were supposed to be here. Churches all around were supposed to be here. But all of a sudden, because the government said or whoever said that the doors needed to be closed, the church dissipated. How was that? That shouldn't have happened. The church was established. We are the church, not the building. We're the church. So why did the church close its doors? We closed our doors because it wasn't convenient anymore. It wasn't comfortable anymore. So what changed? What happened? Belonging. Remember Lot's wife. The longing. The longing changed for what was. What was over there instead of what was over here. Our current condition. And we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough or are we going to continue to supplement him? And supplement his word. You know, we all take supplements for our body, right? Our body is supposed to produce this stuff, but we take supplements to help us. Well, the word of God doesn't need supplements. The word of God doesn't need us to provide anything to help it out. Nothing at all. Did the church lose hope because people proved unfaithful throughout the pandemic? People proved to be unfaithful throughout the pandemic, even though Jesus never left us, nor did he forsake us. Did the church lose hope because circumstances changed, even though we serve a God that never changes? He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Did the church lose hope because things suddenly got hard? Jesus said that in this life you will have trials and tribulation. So why did we lose hope? Have we misplaced our hope? In Zechariah 9.12 it says, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. That I will restore to you double. God is trying to tell us today that we need to switch our strongholds. That we need to switch our strongholds. These people, they were called prisoners of hope. The church has become prisoners to the wrong things. The church, folks, I'm not talking about the unsaved. The church, the body of believers have become prisoners to the wrong thing. And as a result, the word spoken in Judges chapter 2, verses 10, provides us a harsh reality. Because the words that are being spoken there, it's about Joshua. It's the end of Joshua's time. Joshua, the one who came out of Egypt. Joshua, who saw the, the Red Sea part. Joshua, who saw the Jordan River part. Joshua, who saw manna rain from the sky. Joshua, who saw the Jericho walls come down. Joshua, who possessed all the things that the Lord had in store for them. That Joshua. And then it says that Joshua and his generation died. That his generation died. And in verse 10 it says, another generation arose that did not know the Lord nor the works that he had done for them. We need to realize that unfortunately, we're in those times right now, where if the church does not rise up, if the church doesn't get back on the path that Jesus has repaved for us, because he is the way, and he's making a new way, that we're going to see another generation arise, but that generation will be one that doesn't know God. We're one generation away from not knowing God anymore and not worshiping God. Look at the schools already. There's no prayer anymore. There's nothing. I mean, sooner or later, they're going to try to pull out everything. But if we as the church don't rise up and form and get into our place and come together and stop fighting denomination against denomination, church against church, town against town, people against people, they're going to win. Another generation will rise up that does not know him. And it won't know God because we were too busy longing for what was over there versus what was here. We keep longing for how things were. And we don't want to evolve with how things are. How things are and how Jesus is setting us up now. In Hebrews 6.19 it says this, hope we have as an anchor to our soul. Hope that we have as an anchor to our soul. And what's that hope? Jesus. Jesus is our hope. Our salvation is anchored in Jesus. Our deliverance is anchored in Jesus. Our breakthrough is anchored in Jesus. And if we're anchored in him, we're tending sheep, not counting sheep. Come on now. We're tending sheep. As a church, if our hope is anchored in him, then we'll tend to the sheep instead of counting 
how many sheep are actually in the building. And we won't be exercising our own authority and saying it's God's authority. We, we, we like to exercise authority. People like to exercise authority and then put God behind it. Come on. And try to say, yes, God said. And we have to realize that they're God's people that we're tending to. They're not our people. They're not our people. We're supposed to minister to one another. It's not just the pastor. It's the worship leader. It's the worship members. It's the people in the church. We're here to serve, to serve as the body of Christ. And they're not our people. We're not of ourselves. We belong to him. So as a church, we, we can't be concerned about if they come or if they go. My hope is not rested in them or their tithe. Come on now. Come on, it's time to get real. It's time to hold the church accountable that my hope does not rest in your tithe. Tithing is a biblical principle that I wish everybody knew, understood, and practiced, and practiced the right way. But I can't put my hope in you. I can't treat you as a prized horse and that I tend to you and that I take care of you because of what you can give to me because my hope is not in you. My hope is in Jesus Christ. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He's my provider. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, not yours. Not yours. So I can't put my hope in your tithe. You don't prosper me. God prospers me. God prosper me. But unfortunately, churches hope that others don't leave. Or churches hope that others would come in and all for the wrong reasons. And what happens with those wrong reasons is it creates the wrong dependency, like I talked about last week, that we have wrong dependencies. We start relying on the wrong things, and we develop a dependency on this wrong thing instead of a dependency on God and God alone. We have misplaced our hope. Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Without wavering, we can't waver and allow ourselves to become a pillar of salt. We can't waver and allow ourselves to long for what was over there versus what is currently right here. We've, allo we've allowed ourselves to be drugged into this and, and where our hope has been lost because we didn't see Jesus coming through. We didn't see him coming through and what happens was, or what happened was that we were dragged into conforming. And the word says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're not supposed to conform to this world, but we lost hope in the waiting. We lost hope. 2020 came. 2020 left. We're waiting. 2021 came. 2021 left. We're waiting. And people lost hope in the waiting. In the waiting. I mean, how'd you like to establish a church, plant a church a month and a half before COVID starts? But we didn't lose hope in the waiting. We're not going to lose hope in the waiting. We're going to continue to move forward. We're going to continue not to long for what was, but to stand for what is. And he is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is. He is now. Now. Now is the time for us to walk in what he's paved the way for us to do. So what do we do? What do we do? As a body of believers and as individuals, what we do is we go to the scripture again. We go back to the scripture and we find out what does the scripture say? How does it help us? How does it sustain us? How do we grab a hold to something that will help us to stand when the world is telling us to grab a hold of something else? And do you remember when the church was birthed in the book of Acts? When the church was birthed in the book of Acts, the Bible says that there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind, that there were tongues of fire, and that people were now speaking in new tongues. When the church was birthed, people were seeing things that other people weren't seeing. People were hearing things that other people weren't hearing, and people were speaking things that other people weren't speaking. But unfortunately, in the day, in the time, in the place that we find ourselves in, everybody is seeing the same thing everybody else is seeing. Everybody's hearing the same thing everybody else is hearing, and everybody's speaking the same thing everybody else is speaking. And their source could be, source could be social media, Facebook, Instagram, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, 
Telemundo, Univision, it doesn't matter the language. They're all seeing and saying and, and speaking the same thing because that's their source. But God is supposed to be our source. The church is supposed to be founded on the principles of God and nothing else. So it's time for us to turn all that stuff off and turn up to God and look and listen for him and hear the voice of God, the voice of the Spirit, and that way we hear a sound that no one's heard before and that we see things that nobody's seen before and that we hear things and speak things that nobody has spoken before and that we speak it to a generation, a generation that's in need of realigned hope. A generation that's in need of realigned hope. And we're here because Jesus made a way. So let's walk the repaved way together. We're here to walk that way together. People were saying, oh, are you bringing this up just because you're looking to relaunch or just because you're looking to do this? No, I'm looking to realign to the word of God. That's why we're doing this, so that we can stop walking this way and that way. We're at a crossroads, a place of decision, a place where we have to make a decision. And you've heard me say before that we need to tune in to the GPS. And I'm not talking about the global positioning system. I'm talking about God's positioning spirit so that we know which way to go, which way to walk, to turn here, turn there, and follow him and no one else. We have to let go of excuses. We have to let go of fear. We have to let go of discouragement. We have to let go of anger, unforgiveness, disappointment, doubt. We have to let go of all those things. You can choose to be a prisoner of those things, or you can choose to be a prisoner of hope. And you have to ask yourself, which one is going to move me forward? Because when you're a prisoner of hope, you're not depending on your circumstances to change. When you're a prisoner of hope, you're not concerned about circumstances changing. You're concerned and you're relying on the God that never changes. That's who we're here for, the God that never changes. Once again, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So that's what we're supposed to do. So I say to you, let's go back to the scripture. Let's go back to being the church when the church was birthed, a church that, that hears new things, that sees new things, that speaks new things, things that God provides us to, the things that he makes available to us, not what the world makes available to us, not being concerned with what's over there because it seems to look good, but because Jesus is right here. Let's not turn back. There's no turning back. We need to remember Lot's wife and not become a pillar of hope. Amen? Stan, if you'll come play, please. The Lord said to Moses in Exodus 14, verse 15, this is when, you know, the Israelites had left Egypt, and they looked back, and they saw that the Egyptian army was coming. They were coming after them, and they were coming to destroy them. And the people, they just panicked. They're like, they became paralyzed. They're like, you know, we got the Red Sea behind us. What do we do? What do we do? And they just panicked and panicked. Listen to what God tells Moses. Why are you crying to me? Why are you crying to me? Tell the people to get moving. Stop crying to me and do what I've told you to do. I've already set you on a path. Walk in the path that I've made for you. Stop crying to me and just move. Move. So I'm here to tell you today that Jesus already made a way for us. He already made a way for us, but he knows that your path has been worn. He knows that your path has been tired, so he repaved the way. You know, we call it repaving the crossroads. He's repaved a way. So in God's words, it's time to get moving. It's time for us to get moving and be the church that God has called us to be. And set the example for other churches. Set the example throughout the community. Set the example to have those that will link their shields of faith with us and walk forward in doing what we're supposed to be doing, serving, not out of convenience, but out of commitment to him. That's what we're here to do. It's time for the church to be the church again, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to fix our eyes on him, to lift up our hands and say, Lord, have your way in my life. Because the same spirit that empowers us to do so, the same spirit that strengthens us, that's the one that lives inside of us. 
That's the one that's there for us. And that's the one that will have you move forward and serve in what he has ordained for you to serve in as a part of the body, as a member of the body, to be the church, to be his bride. So that which has been unveiled, great. Now let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. You know, I was doing renovations. You all heard about, you know, renovations I did in my home. And when I took down one wall, uh, one uh, drywall, I realized that there was termite damage, that there was activity that was going on. Had I not peeled that back, they would have destroyed the home. So sometimes an unveiling is not a bad thing. So don't take this as we got rebuked, we got this. No, realize that we've been unveiled to see what's been eating away at the church so that we can fix it and rid ourselves of it so that we cannot be destroyed because that's what the enemy would want, for us to be destroyed. And we're not here to be destroyed. We're here to stand as a reflection of him and who he is. Amen? We're one body. So I encourage you today, remember Lot's wife and don't turn back. There's no turning back. Amen? Please stand to your feet. As we get ready to close in prayer, and you know, we're going to partake of, of dessert and just enjoy fellowship together, there's another scripture, scripture I want to read to you all, but I want us to close our eyes and just receive what God has for us today because we are the church we are the church and we need to walk in the newness of what he has and the fullness of what he has for us amen so i'm going to read this scripture to you all as your eyes are closed and i want you to receive its words and it comes from second corinthians 4 verses 16 through 18 and it says therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Your inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that our eyes and our hope rest on you and nothing else, Father God, that we do not longer long for what was over there, Father God. We're not turning back to look at the past and say, oh, I wish 2019, the ways of 2019 were here and the ways from before. Father, we don't long for those things, Father. We long for you and nothing else. And Father, we thank you that you're renewing us day by day. Father, where the outward wor world might seem that things are rough and things are perishing, Father, we know that we, we're being renewed and restored daily. So thank you, Lord, for restoring each individual that's here, those that are watching online, for churches throughout our country and throughout the world, Father God, that you would renew in them a new spirit, a new spirit of hope that rests on you and nothing else, Father, so that your bride can become that true bride once again, unblemished, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, to serve your purpose and your wills and not our own agendas and not our own things, Father God, but your word and your word alone, O God. So I thank you for the strength. I thank you for the encouragement. I thank you for the wisdom that you've provided us this day, O Lord, and that we will no longer turn to the left or to the right, but that we will follow in the fullness of the newness of what you have in store for each and every one of us as we come together as one body, giving you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So God bless you all. I just thank God for each of you because we're all a part of God's body and we need each other to serve one another and to serve our communities. So I pray blessings over you all as you leave this place, but not his presence. And may he just follow you and lead you and provide you new insight so that you too would see things that nobody else is seeing, hear things that nobody else is hearing, and speak things that nobody else is speaking. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Until the next time, I look forward to seeing you all here at the crossroads. Please join us in the fellowship hall.